The topic tonight is racism and the ideology of slavery from Aristotle to George Bush. I thought I'd start with a small subject and then build from there. <laughs> What I wanted to do is really try to understand a few things. Now, I'm not going to give you the definitive interpretation of racism, but to understand it. I mean, along with condemning racism as a social evil, which we do and should keep doing, we also should try to comprehend it keeping in mind that to understand is not to forgive. Racism is the belief and practice that treats ethnically distinct groups as biologically and morally inferior. I would dare to suggest that it has its roots in the earliest forms of tribal organization. A clan or tribe operating together for mutual survival leads to conflicts with other tribes in the competition for food and choice territory. With brotherhood comes otherhood. With ethnic identity comes the risk of ethnocentrism. In claiming a special link with one segment of humanity, we implicitly set ourselves apart from the rest. At least historically, that's what's happened. That's not all that has to happen. One could also have an ethnic attachment and still be a internationalist. By the way, the tribal conflicts are not only with far-off strangers, but often with proximate competitors, as I just pointed out. Shakespeare gives us the Capulets and the Montagues. Real life gives us the Guelphs and Ghibellines, the Iroquois and Algonquin, the Hatfields and the McCoys, the Pakistanis and the Indians. In 1992, we witnessed horrible ethnic wars in the former Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and various other parts of the world, often between people who were more alike than different. Rather than an idea of universal humanity, what we are facing here is a mentality of parochialism and territoriality. The Italians have a term for the provincialism of their peasantry. It was called campanellismo, which can't be literally translated. It might be translated as rule by the bell, the campanello. What it is is the peasant's loyalties extended only so far as in that range of territory that he could still hear the campanello, the church bell of his village. If he wandered too far and could no longer hear the church bell, he was in alien territory. Well, with or without an actual bell, a church bell, a campanellismo was the common mentality of just about all people until well into the modern era, even in rural North America. I remember in 1966, I made a trip to Appalachia up in the hill country, and uh, it was in eastern Kentucky, and... You'd hear people talk to you and say, watch out about the folks in the next holler. A holler would be the valley where people lived. And you'd go to the next, and they'd say, oh, they're not good people. Oh, they're dangerous people. Watch out. And you'd go to the next holler, and they'd be telling you about the folks in the next holler. And each of them, really with some fear and distrust of the other people. This was in the United States, 1996. In each instance, my informants were referring. What did I say? Uh, 1966. It'll probably be 1996 too, but... Um, <laughs> it's good. Everybody's correcting me. It's good. You, <laughs> in each instance, my informants were referring to other people who, in ethnicity, physical appearance, custom, language, class, region, and every other aspect, were indistinguishable from themselves. So people of the same stock can be ferociously set against each other. I don't want to say there's this ethnic mystique that people bond this way. In fact, there are terrible class, regional, religious, and cultural issues or, that come up, or just territorial issues. Louis Adolphe Thiers and his army were just as French as the revolutionary workers of the Paris Commune, whom they slaughtered and executed in great numbers in 1871. Class warfare. No common blood bond prevented the Anglo-Protestant factory owners from overworking and underpaying their Anglo-Protestant employees in England and the United States through much of the 19th century and into the 20th, for that matter. Chinese sweatshop owners in the United States did not hesitate to exploit Chinese immigrant labor. So what I'm saying is that while ethnic differences may cause conflict, ethnic similarity is no guarantee that just treatment and a sense of common humanity will obtain, given certain material and class conditions. I wouldn't argue that ethnic conflict is a dominant and inevitable human proclivity, but it exists as a powerful force. You might recall the words from the Rodgers and Hammerstein Broadway musical, South Pacific. They say, you've got to be... If I had more courage or a better voice, I would sing these lines, but... 
I'll recite them. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your sweet little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. Well, I'm saying something quite different. I'm saying actually the contrary, that you've got to be carefully taught not to hate and fear. Recent research indicates that just letting children be children doesn't always ensure the absence of prejudice. Sometimes it does under certain kinds of conditions. But it doesn't always, especially in a society that has so much of it to begin with. Children start to notice and react to sexual and racial differences and physical deviancies and disabilities at a rather early age. And researchers conclude that conscious effort and an affirming framework are often needed in multicultural situations. We also need a greater awareness of how ethnic cultural differences still obtain in this society. We all think we live in the same culture, but there are all sorts of subcultural differences in groups, sometimes even in one group. I mean, there are ethnic groups within ethnic groups. You can talk about African Americans, but African Americans includes American blacks who have a tradition that goes back 15 generations to slavery. It includes West Indians. It includes recent last couple of generations, people from Ghana and Nigeria, whatever else, and you go on that way. It's it's true of white ethnics too. There are often differences that lead to misunderstanding, lead to decisions like those people over there with their odd behavior. And that behavior often has to do with survival solutions and with problems of material conditions. This was brought home to me once I remember sitting with two buddies of mine. One of them comes from an upper crust wasp white Anglo-Saxon Protestant family. He went, went to Andover, Amherst, Harvard Law, the whole nine yards. And he said when he announced to his wasp father that he was leaving home, a week later his father bought him an airline ticket and patted him on the back and made a lot of supportive statements and indicated that he was proud of him making this move now. And I said, my gosh, that was so different from the reaction in my family. When I announced to my Italian working class father that I was leaving home, he threatened to kill me. <laughs> we got furious. He said, that's a shame to the family. You're betraying, you're abandoning the family. You can't leave. What the hell do you think you're doing? But I was scared. The third guy sitting there, my friend Howard Kahn, he said, well, when I announced to my Jewish father that I was leaving home, he threatened to kill himself. <laughs> And then he had a nosebleed. <laughs> Speaking now as a father, to this day, I don't know which of those three methods is the most manipulative, but um, maybe the nosebleed, that takes quite a bit of doom. In tribal times, the alien was perceived as not being morally equivalent to one's own people. The operational tribal ethic was set down in the Old Testament the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh. Yahweh also better known as the Lord God, Jehovah. In Deuteronomy 2, 32, Moses tells us, assuming Moses did write the first five books of the Bible, which the Bible says he did, so I'm going along with it. (laughs) Moses tells us how Yahweh lends a homicidal helping hand to his chosen people. The leader of an alien tribe and his army come out to fight at Jahaz. And this Yahweh was a tribal god. He was God. Quote, And the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. Only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves and the spoil of the cities which we took. There are, by the way, numerous other mass slaughter scenes as bad as that one throughout several books of the Old Testament. I always think that some people might be less inclined to treat the Holy Bible with such awesome reverence if they ever took the trouble to actually open it up and read some of its more unsavory passages. All right, Deuteronomy shows that there's one ethical code of the say for one's people and another for the outsiders, whose extermination is not only seen as an unfortunate necessity, but as an elevated endeavor, a carrying out of God's will. And by the way, the parallels to modern-day nationalism are so evident as to require not too much explication. The killing of one's own is the crime of murder. The killing of others during a nation-state war is celebrated as an act of patriotic heroism. <laughs> 
Just five months ago, George Bush, speaking before an evangelical conference, said that the U.S. acted in the Gulf War in a manner ordained by the Lord. Deuteronomy lives. Now, there are other more hopeful themes that emerged in antiquity, not quite then, but maybe hundreds of years later, in the Bible itself. In Luke 11.25, we get the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is drawn into an argument by a lawyer who says, Jesus, you tell us to... uh, Jesus, you tell us to... (laughs) Okay, I'm going to tell you a joke. (laughs) I heard it on, I forget who told it. It's about Mary, Jesus, and Joseph when, when Jesus was just a little boy and they were living together. And Joseph, as you know, was a carpenter and he's out there working in the yard. And Jesus comes running out and says, did you call me father? He said, no, I just hit my thumbs. And that's a, <laughs> I think it was Garrison Keillor who told that one. <laughs> so it's all right. The lawyer says, You said, love thy neighbor as thyself, but how do I know who is my neighbor? You can tell this guy's a lawyer right away. He's making complications, getting it all complicated, you know. So Jesus seizes the moment and takes that, and he tells the parable. He tells the story of a man who came down from Jerusalem and who was set upon by brigands, who beat him mercilessly and robbed everything from him, left him half dead by the road. And he's lying there, and a priest passes by, and he calls out for help, and the priest just keeps walking and another citizen comes by from his own people and he calls out for help and he walks by they didn't want to get involved you know and then there came a certain Samaritan who bound up his wounds and took him to a lodgings and paid for his lodgings and administered to him which of these do you think was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves asked Jesus and the lawyer has to concede it was the Samaritan now that story must have astonished Jesus's audience The idea that a Samaritan, a Samaritan might be considered an object of brotherly love was something of a revolutionary notion in a world ruled mostly by the older tribal code. Jesus' message is, we are all one in the sight of God. Even a Samaritan can be your brother. Embrace universal brotherhood. By the way, note, nothing in all of this is said about sisterhood. Women had no distinct identity apart from their roles as adjuncts to the father's husband's family. A universalist identity of womanhood was unthinkable and is visibly emerging after much struggle only in modern times. Next March, by the way, when we celebrate International Women's Day, we might recognize what a vital and revolutionary advance that is in the history of humankind to commemorate universal sisterhood in a world where millions of women still endure dreadful victimization. By late horticultural society, slavery became an important source of surplus accumulation. Now, why should we be talking about slavery? Isn't that a rather passe subject? We all agree it was a bad thing, but it's gone. By the way, you'd be surprised how many people don't agree it's a bad thing. You could read Morrison and Cominger's book. They talk about the happy, contented slaves in the South, you know. Uh, That book that just won all those prizes, Time on the Cross, talk about how slaves actually increased their status and their skills and got training and all this kind of stuff. (laughs) You watch Gone with the Wind and, and slavery looks like a bracing outdoor recreation out there. Quitting time, let's go on in now. Oh, Missy Scarlet, are you happy? And that's the impressions that incredible number of people still have about slavery. In Make Believe Media, I made that point that those movies sometimes are the last chapter of history in our consciousness. So that's one. Secondly, slavery has not passed from history. There are scores of countries where forced labor is still a common practice. And in fact, most of third world labor, the conditions of third world labor are more akin to slavery than they are to anything else. Also, slavery reveals in a magnified fashion the nature of class society. That's why I keep going back to it. How ruling interests are willing to reduce other human beings to utter misery in order to live well off their labor. And how they fashion then all sorts of ideologies to justify the horrors they impose. And for our purpose, the practice and ideology of slavery tell us something about the virulence of racism. By the way, the earliest surviving defense of slavery that we've found written in antiquity was by none other than Aristotle in his politics, written in the 4th century B.C. Aristotle, a great philosopher who proves himself not so great on this subject, 
He maintains, quote, Some men are slaves by nature and others are free men. By the condition of their souls, some are inferior to others. This being so, it is advantageous to both parties for this man to be a slave and that to be a master. It is good and just that some should be governed and others govern in the manner that nature intended. He called this system, by the way, mutual utility. It's a community of interest. It's the best arrangement for everybody. And that has been the position of every ruling class, publicist, leader, pundit, and propagandist from Aristotle's day to today. That the conditions, the social relations of oppression and inequality are really working out to be the best for everyone. They argue that the relations between rich and poor, between privileged and underprivileged, are an inevitable manifestation of nature itself, rather than something that's created by social convention, by inheritance, by class inheritance, namely the family you're born into. I remember giving a class at Lawton State Penitentiary. It's not really a state penitentiary. Lawton Penitentiary is the penitentiary for Washington, D.C. And I sat there, and some of the guys said, how do we end up here, Mr. Prenny? I said, you ended up here because you lacked the foresight and resourcefulness and intelligence to pick the right parents at birth. If you had picked the right parents at birth, you'd be sitting in the U.S. Senate now. <laughs> <laughs> Convention, social convention, inheritance, economic exploitation, and state power. That's what determines your station in life. Even the greatest philosophers we find, Aristotle, Plato, and the rest, may share the self-serving propaganda of their times when property and class wealth are in question because they were themselves members of that class. Now, some might argue, well, look, Slave labor was the normal mode of surplus accumulation in ancient Greece. I mean, that was the natural condition. To criticize Aristotle for accepting what was an acceptable institution is to be guilty of what historians call the sin of presentism. That is, you are anachronistically imposing your present-day standards on a thoroughly different historical era. In response, I would say that, indeed, Aristotle's era is much unlike ours, but not completely so. Were it utterly different in every conceivable way, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. We wouldn't be able to comprehend its literature, its politics, its philosophy. It would all be incomprehensible to us. In fact, it's not incomprehensible. There are recognizable themes of the human condition. There is much in them that transcends the fixedness of time and space so as to be a source of recognizable interest and even enrichment. That's why we love the Greeks and we go back and read the ancients so often. So if we can criticize and we can judge critically Greek art and literature, we can critically judge Greek slavery. Its horrors also transcend the fixedness of time. And the people of that day knew it also. That was my suspicion. I said to myself, there were critics then. We have no surviving writings, you know, from the 4th century. We have little fragments from the 3rd century. But there were critics then that attacked slavery right then in Aristotle's day. How do I know that? Because he wouldn't have been writing a defense of slavery if it wasn't a question of, <clears throat> of controversy. Furthermore, I went back and I picked up politics, which I admit I hadn't looked at since graduate school, and there, right there in chapter 2, he says, certain critics are of a contrary opinion. I said, ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> he doesn't name them, so their names are lost to us in history. But he says there are critics who maintain that, quote, all slavery is contrary to nature. What is wrong with them, Aristotle says. <laughs> so if Aristotle could be challenged in his day, it is not anachronistic to challenge him today. In addition, in every slave society that I have studied, I discovered another social formation, another group of people who were very much against slavery, who were opposed to it, who didn't like it. Every single one of these societies. As far as I know, I'm the first scholar to make this point, and I think it's testimony to the thoroughness of my research. They were called slaves. <laughs> You go up to a slave in ancient Greece or in ancient Rome, you go up to a galley slave who's tied there, a man who's going to spend the rest of his life in misery and agony, pushing one of those oars, and he's going to say to you, oh, you're being anachronistic. It's the dominant mode of our culture. He's going to say, yes, I hate it. I hate it out of my common humanity because this is not the way any human being should be treated. 
And they had very few opportunities to promulgate learned tracts against the institution the way Aristotle could. That side couldn't get around to sitting down and writing their books on this. Although we do have, by the way, a lot of literature from slaves from our own antebellum times of the Old South. We have an enormous rich literature of people, and if there's anything they all have in common is to say, to talk about the hateful nature of this institution. If the ancient slaves didn't write about it, they certainly voted with their feet. They escaped, sometimes against tremendous odds. They rebelled. There were mass uprisings. The Mycenaean helots in the 7th century BC rose up against Sparta. It wasn't an uprising. It was a protracted and bloody war, and it transformed Spartan history. It led to the total transformation of Sparta into a barrack state. It's in our vocabulary. We talk about Spartan conditions. Outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Helots, the Spartans developed a harsh totalitarian militaristic society of perpetual soldiers, a system designed to deny any or most private enjoyments and commit them to this kind of martial state. Sparta, by the way, provides us with an example of how the oppressors become oppressed by their own institutions. By the way, that's not my view, that oppressors are always oppressed by their own institutions. I think they enjoy the positions they're in. I quote one of the great social theorists of the Republican Party, Barbara Bush, who said, <laughs> back when her husband was being questioned in the 88 campaign about his non-tax payments, she said, yes, we are rich. She said, we're rich and we're not ashamed of it. We enjoy our wealth. And I thought, oh, good that they say, you know, instead of saying, what a burden it is, how hard it is. It, it's really a, a social stewardship that we uh, have here. <laughs> the best-known uprising in antiquity was led by Spartacus, 73-71 BC, against Rome, in which over 100,000 slaves were killed. In fact, in the final defeat, 6,000 prisoners, the last remnant of his army, were taken and they were crucified. 6,000 crucifixions along the Via Appia, a morbid monument to the horrors of class oppression erected by the Roman aristocracy. During the 18th and 19th centuries in our own era, there were slave rebellions in Santo Domingo, Jamaica, and Cuba. Santo Domingo, by the way, is very significant, what we call Haiti today. That was the first time in the history of humanity that not only was there a slave rebellion, but a successful one. It went the whole way, complete. They wiped out the slaveocracy, and they set up their own government. That sent shudders, shudders of terror, through the slave-owning class in the United States. Very much like the bourgeois class looked at 1917 and the Bolshevik Revolution, where workers actually seized the Petrograd and Leningrad. It actually has happened, and they didn't rest. They didn't rest for 70 years until they got that undone. Absolute terror that that could happen. It's often thought that Christianity challenged and diminished the practice of slavery. Well, not so. Despite the universalist theme of the Good Samaritan, the New Testament either keeps its silence or it's actually implicitly, not implicitly, actually endorses servitude. Paul, in one of his epistles, instructs slaves to, quote, be obedient to them that are your masters with fear and trembling as unto Christ. The post-apostolic writings of the early church fathers were no better. St. Ignatius insisted that slaves should, quote, not wish to be set free at the public cost lest they become slaves of lust. I like it the way they're always thinking about us, always thinking about our well-being. St. Ambrose, the same way. He said, slavery is a path to rectitude for, quote, the lower the station in life, the more exalted the virtue. That's very Christian. It should be pointed out that Ambrose himself did not seek to advance his own virtue by placing himself in servitude. <laughs> He couldn't. He was too busy thinking about us and helping us and advising us. When I read these guys, you know, I hear, I don't know about you, and maybe it's my problem, but I hear George Bush. I hear him all the time. <laughs> just the other day, just the other day, George Bush came on the air. He vetoed the unpaid family leave. This is a guy of family values. And he said, I'm not going to have some little guy struggling with a business get hit like this. And he's just looking out for the little guy, just looking out for us. And I felt all warm and safe all over. <laughs> Can you see George Bush as a Roman emperor saying, I'm not going to set these slaves free. These poor little guys would be out there. They're not ready for freedom. It would just be terrible for them. 
And in that way, they're always looking out for us. The church, by the way, through the first 10 centuries, owned large numbers of slaves. It was one of the biggest slave owner in Europe. How many of you knew that? How many of you learned that in Sunday school? <laughs> Persons who were held in bondage were barred from going into the holy orders. They couldn't become priests or nuns. As an early pope and a saint, he was a saint. Saint Leo I, as he said, the sacred ministry is polluted by such vile company and the rights of owners are violated. The rights of owners. So he's the Pat Buchanan of that day. He didn't say, oh, they'd feel out of place, it wouldn't be good for them. He says they're vile and it's the way it is and we want them out of here. <laughs> Christian missionaries looking for forced converts developed rather close and extended links with slave traffickers from the 15th to the 18th centuries. As recently as 20 years ago, by the way, the clergy of the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa, using the Bible, Genesis 9.18, Joshua 9.21, to defend apartheid, arguing that blacks were to be considered the children of Ham, all of whose descendants would have to be the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. So you see, this is not some antiquarianism we're dealing with here. We are dealing here with a religio class ideology that has retained currency right into the 20th century. The slave owners of antiquity and the slave owners of the Old South had two things in common. As far as my reading of them, these two things came to me. One, their claim, both of them, their claim that their slaves were benefiting from this institution, that they were contented and they were happily situated in their station in life. Two, their own terror at being massacred by their contented, happy slaves. <laughs> this came up again and again, repeatedly. <laughs> Slave owners in antiquity lived in perpetual fear. Pliny the Younger called slaves the purveyors of dangers, insults, outrages, and wickedness. By the way, you know what Pliny did? There was a case of a slave who murdered his master, and in Rome... In the first century, the rule was that any slave who murders his master, all the slaves of that household have to be executed. The master owned 400 slaves, and he argued for the mass execution. There were demonstrations in Rome of the common people, the free people, against the executions. We always think of the Roman rabble just in the arena, you know, and all this other thing. They were horrified, and they demonstrated and the Roman Senate debated it nervously and then decided, yes, they had to keep the sacred ancient law. And they executed those 400. Then there were riots. And Nero himself had to bring out troops to quell them. So the ordinary plebeian class in Rome was horrified by the treatment of slaves. Horrified by what the aristocrats would do. The slaveholders of the Old South also repeatedly expressed their fears. Remember I told you about Santo Domingo, 1793. An enslaver, a man who enslaved other human beings by the name of Thomas Jefferson, wrote to a fellow enslaver, James Monroe, and he said, it is high time we should foresee the bloody scenes which our children certainly and possibly ourselves have to wade through and we should try to avert them. So they passed totalitarian laws saying that slaves could carry no arms, clubs, or staves, nor make unauthorized visits to other plantations, nor learn to read or write, nor hold religious services of their own, or engage in secret meetings, or congregate in unauthorized groups of more than three or four. The enslavers worked their chattels from dawn to dusk, and sometimes late into the night after. They underfed them. They forced them to live in miserable hovels, you know, George Washington has a reputation of treating his slaves very good. There's that passage of a Frenchman who came and visited the slave quarters on Washington's plantation. No, no, he was a Pole. He was a Polish nobleman. And he was horrified. He said, the poorest serf and peasant in Poland lives vastly better than this, these conditions. And this is Washington who supposedly treated his slaves so good. They underfed them. They forced them to live in miserable hovels. They broke their hearts by selling off children from parents. They flogged them mercilessly with cowhide. Every hit would cut and break skin and break flesh for insubordination or failing to pick their quota of crop. They drastically cut their rations when they got old. They forced bred them. They terrorized them, tortured them, raped and otherwise sexually abused them. 
hunted them down when they escaped, and killed them. And all the while, the old South enslavers and their propagandists emphasized how the masters had most of the sacrifices, sparing no paternalistic effort and expense to rescue the blacks from African barbarism, civilizing, uplifting them. That society that was built on the whip and the gun and the rope and the club, that society could present itself as a natural and beneficial social arrangement, which of course always raises the question, then why the need for so much coercive brutality? The plantation aristocrats, by the way, were men of leisure. They devoted themselves to hunting, dueling, riding, flirting, courting, whoring, sporting, gambling, traveling, drinking, feasting, dancing, and partying. That's what they did. But as one historian, Paige Smith, notes, they also knew that, quote, most of what made Southern life such a dream of delicious self-indulgence was built on black servitude. In their lifestyle, they were the farthest thing from the Spartan ruling class. But they had two things in common with the Spartans. First, they didn't work, and they considered labor to be demeaning and not something a gentleman should ever consider. This is something, again, you don't get, but gone with the wind, it's true. Scarlett O'Hara and all her lady friends and all her gentleman friends, even the saintly Ashley Wilkes, none of them worked. They didn't work. Those men could ride horses, but they didn't know how to breed them or feed them or care for them or make saddles or shoe them or build the fences that corralled them. They could hold elaborate parties, but the ladies didn't know how to bake biscuits or chicken. There are some reconstruction accounts of some of the ladies asking their household servants, how do you light the oven and how do you bake a chicken and how do you bake biscuits? The other thing they had in common is that the South was an armed camp, just like Sparta, designed to safeguard itself against its own slave populations. A whole bunch of visitors came down and commented on that again and again. Uh, Everybody here is armed. Everybody here is a soldier. These armed patrols on horseback going up and down the countryside constantly looking everywhere in the South, paramilitary forces, military, a very well-developed militia. As Frederick Law Olmsted pointed out, military forces invested with more arbitrary and cruel power than any police in Europe. Another historian writes, the constant possibility of insurrection required that attention should ever be given to the militia. We're living through that right now, my friends. The one public career profession that grows in numbers is the police. Well, we're closing daycares and libraries and hospitals. We're building more prisons. You are listening to author Michael Parenti on racism and the ideology of slavery. At the end of the program, there will be information on how to obtain a copy of this talk. The South's military tradition, you see, was not just some abstract regional idiosyncrasy. Today, we still talk about the Southern military tradition. You know, there's so many in the army and all that sort of thing. That's not an abstract thing. It, it, it developed from the necessities of class race oppression. After the Civil War, vengeful Southerners engaged in widespread arson, beatings, killings, terrorization of the black population. Again, though, with that remarkably self serving capacity that has been the mark of every privileged class in history, they could reverse the roles of victim and victimizers. In his trips through the South immediately after the Civil War, the journalist Whitelaw Reed noted that ex slaveholders repeated the same complaint over and over. Quote, We have been the best friends a nigger ever had, yet this is the way they treat us. And how they treat us, they do things like leave the plantation, try to start small farms of their own, which, by the way, they did under Reconstruction and were very successful and very resourceful farmers, most of which were destroyed. Most of those farmers were terrorized or murdered. No one in the South... No one in the South worked harder for less than those of African descent, yet they were said to be lazy and shiftless. And the same could be said today. No one in this economy works harder for less than the African-American proletariat, and yet it is the most maligned. In the post-Civil War era... (laughs) During Reconstruction, one observer down there noted, critical observer, he said, quote, It is not an uncommon thing to see five or six of these young aristocrats who never worked a day in their lives and who are depending on bank stock, which is no longer worth a cent, sitting around cursing and damning the Negroes for not working. Engels once noted that about ancient slavery that it left its poisonous sting long after it passed from the scene. And the same could be said about servitude in our own country. 
One of the poisonous after effects of slavery is racism, a point so obvious that it's often overlooked. I mean, I already noted that ethnic animosities antedate slavery. I'm not trying to reduce it. But with the advent of slavery, racism, a very interesting thing starts to happen. Racism is developed into a law and an ideology. Even in ancient Attica, you got the same kind of thing. Most of the slaves in ancient Attica, in Greece, and, and even in Peloponnesia, were deracinated foreigners. They were better known as barbarians. And they were accorded the contemptuous term, andropoda. Andropoda means a man-footed creature or man-footed animal. So they had feet like men, but they were not considered human. So what you have, it's very interesting. What you have here in the fourth century, you've got racism justifying slavery. You have the dehumanizing racist designation suggesting a biological inferiority here and used to justify class oppression. In the Old South, the laws that were intended to protect slavery also codified racial supremacy. Slave status was restricted to non-whites. Interracial marriage was banned because there had been interracial marriage even back in the 17th century and early parts of the 18th century among indentured poor whites and blacks. Theories began developed about racial psychology and physiology, including skin pigmentation theories. It was maintained among many of the people, and even among the abolitionists, that the slave was not fit for immediate freedom. Therefore, emancipation would have to be gradual. But if he's not fit for freedom, then slaves must remain in bondage forever. It was the system of slavery itself that was preventing them from becoming fit for anything but slavery. After emancipation, and to this day, not fit for freedom, was translated into not fit for equality. It represents the shift from slavery to racism. Again, offering the same circular argument. Blacks are not ready for equality and have to be prepared for it, presumably by whites, and have to earn it, though whites are born with it. But as long as inequality exists in every area of social development, blacks perforce must remain forced in a state of inequality. Slavery and racism go together because they bolstered the same oppressive class relationships. We shouldn't overlook the class interest involved. That's what I'm saying. Why did the European colonizers in North America bring African people to the Western Hemisphere? Why did they bring them here in such numbers with so many dying in the awful Middle Passages? Was it that the Calvinist fathers one day got up and said, let's add some warmth and color to our lives? Uh, uh, <laughs> or I want to hear that sweet, soft singing. Why did they bring, why did they bring all those people here? They brought them here for one reason, and that was to work them, to work them, and to get rich off their labor, to work them from dawn to dusk. They brought them here for a class interest, to expropriate the value that their labor produced, to get rich off the super exploitation of African labor. The rich white colonizers abducted black people to toil on land that they stole from red and brown people. <laughs> and speaking of stolen lands, racism is a byproduct not only of slavery, but of imperialism. When I wrote The Sword and the Dollar, I began coming across some very startling comments. Now, the imperialists were not out to victimize darker people just because they were darker. They didn't say, well, let's just go kill dark people. They readily exploited persons of any color, by the way. The first victims of imperialism, if you read Stavrianos, was Eastern Europe, made of Caucasians. The earliest victims of British imperialism, to take the biggest imperialism of all until World War II, were the Irish, who were also Caucasians. So they, they'll victimize anybody if it serves their interests. So if they exploited darker people, it was, again, for economic gain. But in short order, they rationalized their atrocities in racist terms. Again, racism became very functional. I mean, after all, if I come down here, I burn your crops, I slaughter your herds, I destroy your townships, I destroy your little copper mines and your iron foundries, and your, or this or that, I destroy your trade, I massacre your men, I rape your women, I enslave your people, I spit your babies on bayonets. I've got to rationalize that to some degree. I do two things. First, I deny the humanity of the victims. The colonizers deny the humanity of their victims. That's the function of slavery and designate them as moral inferiors. Second, they ascribe to them the very homicidal ferocity that they are affecting on them. 
When I was a kid, I know who the homicidal, savage, killing, murdering people were. They were the Indians, right? They were the natives in the British movies in Africa. They were the savage killers. It was only much later I realized that history had been stood on its head. Racism is functional for both those things. There were some rare exceptions, by the way, in the early settlers, the first settlers. There was a man that I was very intrigued by named Thomas Morton. He wrote a book called, back in New Canaan, or New Canaan, I think it's called. There were like two surviving copies of it. Henry Adams brought one back from Europe in the 18th century. Somehow he landed with the Plymouth Bay group. He was in Plymouth Bay Colony from 1627 to 1645. Pleasure-loving Thomas Morton, his name was. And he took the trouble to fraternize with the Massachusetts Indians. That was the name of the tribe, Massachusetts Indians. And he found them to be, it's not a ball game, uh, not a team. Or anything. And he found them, quote, to be more full of humanity than the Christians. They were neither dangerous nor mischievous nor dull, he said. He found them to be very intelligent, very subtle, very ingenious. They had an admirable competence in farming, in hunting, in midwifery, in medicine and they lived rich and contented lives. That's what Morton found. Morton also celebrated the wonders of the land, the great flocks of duck and wild turkeys and herds of venison that passed by not far right in front of one's cabin, the rivers and bays teeming with fish, the oyster banks a mile long filled with oysters, good and fat and plump, the endless beds of mussels and clams, the many beautiful groves of trees, the fine round hillocks, delicate large plains, crystal fountains, and the clear running streams. He has lyrical passages. In fact, this is a paraphrase right from his book. But where Morton wanted to fraternize, the Puritan saints of Plymouth Bay wanted to colonize. Where Morton saw a fecund and beautiful land, the Puritans saw a godless howling wilderness filled with evil spirits and dangerous wild beasts. They hated the land. They hated it and they feared it. They detested it until they could subdue and transform it into personal property. Where Morton saw friendly, intelligent, indigenous people, the Puritans saw brutes, devils, and devil worshippers, quotes, whose souls were to be consigned to their proper place in hell by a process of extermination. The new settlers abused the natives' hospitality, defaced their graves, massacred their tribes, and exulted that God was pleased to smite his heathen enemies and give us their lands for inheritance. That's a direct quote. And give us their lands for inheritance from Captain Mason, who led the expedition against the Pequot Indians. With the choice properties going to the Endicotts, the Winthrops, the Underhills, the Bradfords, the Peabodys, Patrician names, New England patrician names that are still with us today. You know, it's really remarkable how often pleasing God, when you read history, how often pleasing God becomes a matter of murder and real estate acquisition. <laughs> Racism in the service of imperialism. George Washington likened the red savages, quote, to wolves, both being beasts of prey, though they differ in shape. While well, colonizing and slaughtering the people of Southwest Africa, 80,000 Herero tribesmen, 60,000 of whom were killed by the German army, Kaiser Wilhelm described them as baboons. In his poem, The White Man's Burden, Rudyard Kipley refers to the Asian victims of British imperialism as half devil, half child, dehumanizing them and demonizing them. In 1897, Winston Churchill judged the Afghans to be dangerous and as sensible as mad dogs, fit to be treated as such, and he recommended the use of poison gas. About the same time, Lloyd George, Prime Minister of England, said his government should retain the right to kill niggers. He was referring to Asians and Africans. To justify overseas expansion, American presidents have talked about the Anglo-Saxon obligation to uplift and civilize inferior peoples, as McKinley said of the Filipinos, as Woodrow Wilson said of just about all of Latin America. Now notice something here. We're not talking about Bubber. We're not talking about Joe Redneck. We're not talking about Archie Bunker. These quotes are from the most eminent members of society, Governor Winthrop, George Washington, Winston Churchill, Rudyard Kipling, Lloyd George, the upper-class gentlemen, the leaders, the patricians, the imperialists. To this day, racist beliefs have persisted both as a cause and a justification of class race conditions. It's used to explain away racist police murder, poverty, non-existent job opportunities, substandard education and housing, and discrimination in all areas of life. 
In other words, racism is not just an internalized personal attitude, an interpersonal attitude. It's an externalized social relation that continually bolsters the very conditions that make it so functional. Discussions of racism usually fix, by the way, they usually fix on attitudes. They're almost always focused on attitudes. Why do people feel that way? But we ought to keep in mind that the larger system of power and interest sustains racist attitudes. So we talk not only of attitudinal racism, we also talk about institutional racism. And what I'm asking also that we talk about is structural or systemic racism. In modern-day capitalist society, racism serves a number of systemic functions. First, employers have always desired a surplus workforce. When there's full employment, when jobs go looking for workers, pay goes up. When pay goes up, you cut into profit margins. When workers are in superabundant supply in an overcrowded job market, then wages can be kept down. For generations, you, and the way to keep wages down and have that oversupply is to have what Marx called the reserve army of labor. Women, children, immigrants served in that reserve army of labor increasing the competition for jobs and depressing wages and so too have people of color by keeping African Americans and Latinos in this kind of ethnically delineated underclass racism can secure that reserve army you know Bush is criticized for doing nothing for the economy and it might seem so given our enormous problems I think of what Cardinal Richelieu said over 300 years ago Cardinal Richelieu said the power to do nothing is great but it must not be abused. And, <clears throat> yet I would... But I would suggest that Bush is doing exactly what he wants to do according to his class interests. Free trade, recession. He doesn't get around to a job program because he doesn't want a job program. He's leading in the way he wants to lead. That's his dilemma. Otherwise, he could start doing all these things and win votes and all that sort of thing. That's not what he wants to represent. Another function of racism is by keeping a permanent underclass that's who does the dirty work of society, the toughest, mindless, lowest paying jobs. So what you have is rather than the normal rate of exploitation, you have what some theorists call super exploitation, which allows the investor to accumulate wealth at an even greater rate of return on an especially disadvantaged sector of the workforce. The same conditions, as I said before, of super exploitation obtained in the third world, which is why they want free trade to get themselves open to have access to the Mexican labor market. Racism, by the way, also helps keep the working class fragmented and disorganized. The owners and bosses are safest when the workers are busy fighting each other for crumbs rather than uniting for a larger slice of the pie. And by the way, economic elites are aware of this and they consciously propagate this. Oh, what do you have, a conspiracy theory, Parenti? Here we go again, you know? No, no, I don't have a conspiracy theory. George Bush ran those Willie Horton ads as a way of bringing us together. George Bush harps and attacks affirmative action and quotas and inner city crime. He does those things to bring us together. Yes, they consciously do that. And you want to call that conspiracy? Call it conspiracy. I don't know what you mean by conspiracy. They consciously pursue their interests just as other people might. The minute you ascribe human agency to the elite elements in society, someone considers you propagator of conspiracy theory. By the way, rulers have always done that. The Habsburg Empire played off one nationality against another. That's how it survived right up until 1914 or whatever. Plato and Aristotle stressed the desirability. Plato in his laws, Aristotle in politics, stressed the desirability of importing slaves of different nationalities and languages as a necessary means of preventing them from getting together in rebellion. Aristotle, quote, the husbandmen should by all means be slaves, but not, but not of the same nation, for thus they would be laborious in their business and safe from attempting any novelties. European invaders of Africa and North America use bribes, deceptions, threats, gifts of firearms to play off tribes against tribes. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy actuality. <laughs> In 17th century America, you got a very interesting development. Indentured white servants and African slaves got together. In many instances, there was coalescence. They Socially, they often... Planned together, they often went into uprisings together. And this terrified the slaveholders. Laws were passed prohibiting any interracial mixing. 
which is evidence of the fact that there was interracial mixing. And you've got to pass a law to prohibit it. That means it's going on. <laughs> they feared that the white indentured servants would join the blacks or the Indians, which, by the way, happened. Blacks and Indians came together. Sometimes whites and Indians are blacks, or sometimes all three groups in these kinds of uprisings. Desperate, poor people who are totally, terribly super exploited. The colonial governments in the 17th century and into the 18th century had a conscious policy of playing off these groups, turning Indians against blacks and turning poor whites against both. They consciously pursued that policy. In the post-bellum era, the Ku Klux Klan was used by bosses to terrorize labor combinations and keep whites and blacks at odds. By the way, the Klan in the post-Civil War era was not made up of Bubba and Joe Redneck. The early personnel in the Klan were merchants, landowners, bankers, all sorts of odd people that you wouldn't expect riding around at night with a bed sheet on. <laughs> that is, it was the property classes, store owners, people like this, small investors, big investors. They were the ones who got together and started to terrorize. In fact, initially terrorizing both poor whites and blacks to keep them apart. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, oil and mining companies in this country consciously promoted disunity and hostility among immigrant groups in the company towns. They even went so far as to mix the work teams, nationalities, one Swede, a Pole, a Hungarian, an Irish, just exactly in the way that Aristotle had advised. Not that they had read Aristotle, but they were just responding to the same material and class interests. In U.S. prisons, officials have consciously promoted friction between white and black inmates, doing everything to discourage unity. The same strategy with urban police forces, with street gangs. When the Crips and the Blood signed that truce, that day I said, the police are going to try to do everything they can to instigate. And by the way, that's true. KPFA had a special report on that, how the police are deliberately trying to provoke and instigate conflicts between the Crips and the Bloods. Racism also serves as a very good cultural issue, quote, a non-class issue of right-wing leaders. They're always on the lookout for non-class issues. They're always on the lookout for non-economic issues to try to win allegiance from people who have no common interest with them. Pornography in the arts, abortion, to split the working class on that, especially the Catholic Democratic vote, busing, affirmative action quotas, flag burning, prayers in the school, you know, all these kind of things. The, the new hottest one they got now is too much litigation, too many trial lawyers. You've seen that? That's really going to set everybody on fire. I see. <laughs> Tell that to an unemployed steel worker, huh? But inciting them, being able to cut through, and racism, of course, does that. So racism is usually seen as an aberrant, grotesque offshoot from what is a basically rational society. What I'm arguing here is the other way around. It's a rational output from a basically aberrant and distorted society. <laughs> Much of politics involves the rational manipulation of irrational symbols. And just because those symbols are manipulated irrationally, it doesn't mean that the people who are manipulating them don't know what they're doing. It's the same with anti-communism. It's the same with the super patriotism. It's the same with use of wars and jingoism and the demonization of foreign leaders. And let me wind it down here. I've talked long enough. Let me say, uh, you know, I was thinking about where I just moved here from, Washington, D.C. And I remember in Washington, last year there was this huge gala for President Bush at the Washington Hilton. I lived about eight or nine blocks from there. I was walking down to a DuPont Circle and I saw it. And there were all these... Um, huge, monstrous stretch limousines, these gas-guzzling ecological disasters, <laughs> pulling up. And out of them came these guys with their $1,000 tuxedos and these women with $80,000 furs on, these furs all over them, you know. I looked at this uh, Republican aristocracy as they went into the Hilton. You know what I said to myself, brothers and sisters? I said, you know, these people, they treat other human beings and animals and the environment pretty much the same way, to be used as disposable commodities for their satisfaction. For them, it's still life on the old plantation. Well, I think the only ray of hope amidst all this dreadful history, and I did give you a lot of dreadful history tonight, is 
is the, maybe the fitful and the progression, the struggle from servitude toward liberation, the fight for legal equality, the fight for economic democracy that's still going on. In recent decades, against all the violent legacies of slavery and racism, against all the institutional and systemic forces that batten on racism, against a racist culture propagated by the news and entertainment media, against the laws of state governments that propagated Jim Crow and protected racial terrorism for three generations, more than that, against the White House leadership through the 1980s and 1990s that manipulated and used and incited racist resentments, against all of this and more, I haven't completed the list, against all of this, there were and there still are people who have organized, who have educated, who have agitated, who have fought back, who struck who used boycotts, who rioted, who resisted, who got arrested, who fought for equality and social justice, black and white together, fighting with righteous determination, not only on behalf of people of color, but for our common humanity, our universal brotherhood and sisterhood. Thank you.